well. Hello, everyone. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, this webinar is called Co-ops Giving Young People a Fairer Future. Um, and so I've been invited by Co-ops UK to, um, to run this webinar. Um, it's one of a series of webinars being offered by The Hive. Um, and The Hive is, is um, a business support programme for co-ops, um, but we're going to hear a lot about co-ops today, um, as well as the ways in which people um, who want to can, can try and start a new co-op. Um, so just as a reminder, we're going to be, um, I think we started recording this already, so if you don't want to be on camera, then switch your camera off. Um, but if not, I'm really excited to be here. Um, Okay, I'm going to get started then. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Sim, um, or Sim N. Madiwala. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I live in Brighton. I live in a housing co-op in Brighton. Um, and as we'll come on to later, um, I live with Connie over here, who is another speaker. Um, and so I, I um, got started in co-ops through a student housing co-op, um, which I helped set up um nearly four years ago now also in brighton um that was sort of my route into co-ops um and is partly why i'm quite so enthusiastic about them um so i'm just gonna um hand over to the speakers one by one to introduce themselves um first up we've got lucy hi everyone uh, i'm lucy um i'm from infect digital cooperative I also work with some other tech co-ops. Um, we're, yeah, we're digital co-ops, so we, mm, simple, simple answers that we make apps and websites, but we kind of work with clients on lots of digital problems and try and help them find solutions. Uh, and I mostly work now doing kind of client, client liaison and project management and design work. Great, thank you, Lucy. Look forward to talking to you. Um, Connie. Hi, I'm Connie. Um, I use she, her pronouns, um, and I live in out of town co housing cooperative in Brighton with Sim. Mm -hmm. Yes, coming to us all the way from downstairs. Um, and last but not least, we've got Tamsin. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Tamsin. I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm from the Bradford Cooperative Association, and um, which is comprised of Bread and Roses, which is a co-working space and a cafe and has loads of meeting rooms, and also Chapel Street Studio, which is a creative um, agency for loads of different creatives in Bradford to kind of work together on projects. And yeah, we're a community-owned business. Um, and so, yeah, really excited to be here and to be talking to you, lovely people. That's really great. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I recognise the, the name Chapel Street Studio because I realised that we work with them. So I'm part of a thing called the Young Corporators Network um, and we work with them to help. Um, they've been helping us make our website and stuff. It's a lot more than just that. Um, but OK, so so um, the format of this is going to be that we're going to have um, like a Q&A format. So I'm going to ask each of the speakers questions one by one. We'll go from Lucy to then Connie to then Tamsin, all of whom come from quite different backgrounds and different co-ops, um, also different parts of the country. And so we're going to hear a bit from each of them about uh, what they do, what their co-op does um, and, and what, what co-ops really look like for them. Um, and at the end, we'll have sort of hopefully 10, 15 minutes set aside for Q&A from the audience. So that's from all of you. Um, and if you have questions as and when they come, they'll come up, see if you can pop them in the chat. Um, and if I miss them, then either Leila or Petra, who are here from Cops UK, um, will be able to flag them up with me. Um, but if we're all ready, I think that's all of the housekeeping out of the way. Should we get started with you, Lucy? Hi, Lucy. Cool. Hi, Lucy. Um, I know I got to catch up with you a little bit just before this started, but um, do you want to tell us where you are at the moment? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I'm in a co-working space, which is very hip and trendy, but a bit noisy. Um, so I'm sorry if there's a bit of background noise. I hope it'll be minimal. 
Um, it is fine for me, but as that, it, that could be an access thing. If anyone is having issues, do flag that up in the chat and um, see if we can change that. Um, but OK, thank you so much for joining us today, Lucy. Um, it was really good to catch up with you last week, week before, um, to kind of find out a bit more about your co-op. Um, so I guess just really quickly, not really quickly, this is your section. Um, tell me a bit about your co-op. Um, what does it mean to be a um, digital co-op and what sort of work do you get involved in there? So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so we're in fact digital cooperative. We set up three years ago, four years ago maybe, and we set up because we'd all done Founders and Coders together, which is a software development bootcamp, which was also a co-op. They've kind of changed structure now, but they're very co-op friendly, if not actually a co-op. Uh, and so we were just really within the network of, <clears throat> of cooperatives. They were sharing a co-working space with Outlandish or another tech co-op. And so when we, me and my colleagues, started working together and decided we wanted to start our own, or well, we didn't really think we want to start a business. We just thought we want to keep working together. And so we ended up starting a business and we knew, we didn't really think about it being anything other than a co-op. Um, I think a lot of us, uh, yeah, we just, we enjoyed that way of working together. We didn't want to set in place any kinds of um, hierarchies or power structures that we then had to uh, work within. And yeah, it just seemed like it, it was, it's interesting because the ecosystem that we were in, that was just the, it was almost like the passive choice was to become a co-op. And it would be interesting to see what the world would be like if that was just the passive choice. Um, anyway, so we've been going for four years now. And yeah, like I said, we work mostly with, um, uh, well, <clears throat> we often work with charities, but really the way we decide whether or not we want to take on a client is just if the three of us think it's something we want to work on. So we don't believe that to do good, you have to be a charity. We don't believe that to do interesting things, you, yeah, you have to be in that world. We do think that you can be a business and do interesting, important things as well, like co-ops. Um, so, so we just choose whether to work on something based on whether we find it interesting. Uh, and, and that's a really nice feature of being, I guess, working for ourselves. Thank you so much for that explanation. Um, yeah, I remember you saying before that like you sort of, it was an automatic choice for you to join a co-op. And I think definitely for me, it was more of like a, it's an accident. Like it didn't actually start with housing co-ops. It started with like a bicycle co-op. I wanted a bicycle. And so I joined this thing and turned out that I was with them for life. I wasn't until I was a student, but you know, I fell into it. I think I think a lot of people find out about co-ops um, accidentally, but um, oh yeah, people are just asking for the website if you've just got um, a link on hand to in fact. Um, but but so that's really interesting that you sort of um, had this had this um, kind of surroundings um, of of people being part of co-ops. Um, and you also said that you um, just wanted to keep working together with the, the three of you and and so it just kind of became an automatic choice can you talk a little bit more about like what the three of you do um how do you split up work and how does it how does it work being a co-op are you able to sort of take on equal amounts or do you have to sign off on, on all of the things um are you able to talk a bit about that yeah um and just but before i do i think it's interesting what you said about ending up into a co-op by, by being part of a bike co-op because yeah i was part of a food co-op when i was at university and my colleague max was also like vaguely connected to some kind of co-op and yeah all of us just managed to get to a certain stage in our lives without ever having got a proper job and we were like okay well we don't want to start now so <laughs> this is this seems like the right choice um so when what do we do and do we all do things equally i think when we first started we were obsessed with doing things equally we kind of thought like being a co-op means we all have to do everything to an equal amount and i think that one of the biggest learnings over the last four years has been that uh what is it that like um 
fairness doesn't necessarily mean equality or something like that. Justice is not always equal. I can't remember. I'm sure there's a quote there somewhere that I'm referencing. Um, but basically that at first we thought that all of us had to know about the finances and all of us had to know about the clients and all of us had to know about everything and that we all had to make equal decisions on everything and then that got really exhausting uh, and to the point where I said you know what I'm happy to not make any decisions on the finances and to give over my authority on that to you Max who does the finances because I trust you and I trust that if it's important enough then you're going to come and ask us um, and so maybe that maybe that was able to happen in the end because we've been working together for a while and we built that trust up maybe it would be harder to do straight from the beginning maybe it's like a necessary process but yeah I think something really interesting is that tension between equality like what's what's equal what's fair what does that look like and it's not necessarily as straightforward as it being cut evenly yeah no i definitely feel that um i do a bit for finances in in, in my co-op but it it doesn't feel like everyone needs to do everything um is it more that like you you give you give consent to other people to do those things yeah and you trust that everybody have you ever heard of the prime directive oh, i can put it in the chat later but it's basically like again i'm paraphrasing but trusting that everybody is doing their best at any given time with the information that they have available and i think that if you're able to build up relationships with your co-workers um where you really truly believe that about each other then yeah, then you're able to kind of hand over a bit of that authority to each other, which makes for a much more efficient, I think, working experience, more pleasant. I really like that. I think coming from a housing court background, I, I, I appreciate being able to have that with like my housemates too. Um, so, oh yeah, the thing about founders encoders. Oh, I kept thinking it was finders encoders. I kept mishearing it. Okay, thanks for writing that down. <laughs> um so so um it's really helpful to hear you talk a bit about like um how you split work up and sort of why you got into co-ops um but just as a last question kind of um before we go on to the next speaker connie um i'd like to to hear a bit about um so i know that you said that to make it quite simple you work with um apps and web you make you work on building apps and websites but it's more than that right you you work on a lot of digital problems and so I want to ask a bit about like the um the 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 kinds of work that you do um and I think I'm specifically thinking about um an example that you shared when we were chatting last time which was about um like working with quite a few domestic violence charities um and what what that has um looked like and and how um how you've been able to help develop apps for them or, or um work with them I'm, I'm sort of seeing this as an example for some different projects that you do Are you able to talk about that a bit yeah so i guess the the what we really do the service that we really offer is to speak to people find out about their problems and then if we can offer a digital solution then we will sometimes we might find out about the problems and be like oh actually we don't think you need a digital solution we think maybe you need something different maybe you need to invest more time in I don't know staff resources or training or whatever I don't know that's not really our area of expertise but I don't think it's digital um, and sometimes we'll say okay this is the problem and we think that this might be a digital solution that could help and then we might try and we propose it we work on it together we might build it try and test it that kind of thing um, and so the work that I've been I've ended up working with quite a few different um, domestic abuse charities kind of because I did it with I worked with one of them and then maybe got recommended to another and I think maybe they appreciated that I had some domain knowledge after having worked with one um, <clears throat> and what we were able to build for them were it was varied like a lot of ways of helping people communicate char with charities I mean that's such a <clears throat> common issue to so many charities is that they need a way for their users to be able to get in touch that is efficient and that doesn't like monopolize all of their resources 
So we're doing that. Um, I also made a kind of resource library, um, which provided resources, but also sharing stories between survivors, uh, which was really interesting. And it's just been, it's been interesting to like build up knowledge across different um, organizations and also to be a part of that sharing of knowledge between them. Um, I think charities are changing as well nowadays, but they used to be really quite competitive and that's still kind of the case, which feels so weird to be talking about competition in that space. Like it just really doesn't sit right. And I, I'm sure ch that charities feel that way as well, but um, they're forced to compete for resources and funding. And so that mindset ends up coming in. Um, but I think it is changing and particularly it's been nice to be a part of this group um like slightly of domestic abuse charities who have really said we don't want to compete we want to work together and share resources together um so yeah that's been a nice insight and that they've been able to start doing that through the medium of digital work has been really cool yeah um that's that's really good to good to hear about and i can definitely relate to that like Feeling competition between organizations when like I don't know you can't out compete different organizations you need to coexist um and through that work together um thank you so much Lucy it's been so great hearing from you um and we will come back to you um but for now I think we're gonna go to our next speaker Connie Connie Finney um hello Hello. Um, so we just heard from um, from Lucy, who is part of a um, digital co-op um, working in the tech sector. Um, but co-ops can look like lots of different things. Um, and so um, for Connie and indeed for me, um, this has looked like a house um, living in a house where we own it ourselves. So um, I'm going to I'm going to start by asking you a question, Connie, and that is, um, what, what is a housing co-op? Can you tell me a bit about this? So in a nutshell, um, yeah, everyone who lives in the house is a member of the cooperative um, and we collectively own and manage the house. Um, we are our own landlord, so we don't, we don't have a landlord um, and we all work together to make decisions and to pay off our loans um, and we all pay rent to the co-op. Um, but because we manage the house, then we get to collectively set our own rent levels, depending on, you know, how much our mortgage is and the loans and the general wealth of the co-op. Um, although some housing cooperatives have like a committee where people are elected and they get to make decisions for the whole co-op. Um, our co-op has a non-hierarchical flat structure um, where everyone has an equal say in decision making um, and no one's voice is valued more than anyone else's. Um, that said, yeah, we don't do all the work collectively. Um, we split into working groups and um, some people take on jobs that align with their strengths and knowledge base and stuff. Um, and then the non-hierarchical, I guess, the, yeah, the non-hierarchical nature of the, of the co-op is reflected as well in the way that we make decisions. So we use something called consensus decision making um, where yeah, everyone has to agree on a decision in order for a proposal to be passed. And if even one person doesn't agree, then um, we have to go back and rework the proposal until everyone's satisfied. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good description of, of housing court. Thanks, Connie. Um, and I also know that um, the part of Radical Roots. So, so can you tell me a bit about what it means to be uh, a Radical Roots um, housing co-op? Sure. So Radical Roots is a national organisation um, and it's basically a network of co-ops um, and it's um, yeah, an organisation. It's like the co-op of co-ops, I guess. Um, it helps co-ops. It helps to set up co-ops and helps to finance them and stuff. Um, co-ops can only join Radical Roots, though, if they kind of align with its kind of social and political values. Um, and these are broadly kind of anti-capitalist. And members are expected to vote some of their time to kind of social activism and working towards what they call radical social change. Um, and Radical Roots believes that cooperatives in and of themselves work against kind of capitalist, the, the values of capitalist society, namely seeding kind of cooperation and community against like individualistic and neoliberal values. Um, and Radical Roots do it, they're quite a broad chair to do a variety of things. So yeah, they can offer loans and help to seed co-ops and they offer political education. And they also um, kind of teach people like the basics of like 
being in a co-op so kind of introduction to facilitation introduction to meet uh, minute taking and stuff and because it's a co-op as well any decisions that are made in radical roots every one of its member member co-ops has to agree on decisions and we practice consensus decision making on that national level as well when it comes to decisions made within radical roots yeah cool yeah um i think that pretty well documents sort of um what it means to be part of part of the network um so so let's talk about um your co-op our co-op um so out of town um tell me about it and how it functions um so yeah we're called out of town we shorten this to oot um when we yeah we're in brighton um, and we're made up of two houses and we have 17 members uh, the co-op was initially set up in 1991 um, and it started out with members squatting abandoned houses um, eventually in 2007, the co-op raised enough funds to buy the house that I'm current, me and Sim are currently living in at the moment. And then the second house was born into, um, bought in 2016. Um, we have monthly general meetings with the whole co-ops, so that's across the two houses. Um, and that's where most of our co-op business happens, you know, which deals with kind of co-op wide issues like finance, maintenance, recruitment, et cetera. And then we have house meet, monthly house meetings as well, which deal with kind of more domestic things like cooking rotors and cleaning rotors and, you know, planning social events and stuff. And um, we also have monthly work days as well, where we spend time, you know, taking care of the house and the garden. Um, and that includes like big practical jobs. So like recently, some of my housemates recently installed a sink and um, we've put up sheds in the past and, and different things like that and just taking care of the house generally. Um, Sim and I have been member, members now for about two and a half years um, and in that time I think it's fair to say that we've yeah, learned a lot including lots of DIY skills, cooking for 10, sometimes 12, 15 people, um, conflict resolution, active communication um, and then kind of yeah, skills like how to take minutes and how to facilitate meetings and stuff. Yeah. Excuse me. Thank you Connie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you say that we've both been members for two and a half years. Like, I feel like I've learned so much about just what it means to be to, to own a house in that time. Like things that you don't even think about when you're a renter, but like things that you can have quite a lot of control over. Um, and yeah, yeah. Thank you for shedding some light on that. Um, I guess I guess. My next question is more focused towards, you know, our our. our title of this webinar young people so like why do you think that um young people should get involved in co-ops like yeah yeah what do you think about that um I think yeah co-ops are really really great for young people especially kind of in the more precarious times that we live in I think young people have it very hard at the moment in terms of kind of like yeah a lot of housing insecurity you know the the, the job market is is smaller um you know it's more difficult to well it's, it's less it's looking less likely that young people will be able to own their own homes um, so and I think it comes back to the reasons why co-ops are so good for young people it comes back to the kind of core values of co-ops. So, you know, the, the emphasis on community collaboration and democracy. I mean, a lot of housing kind of private rented housing today is kind of focused around structured. Uh, it's it, yeah, it's predicated on isolation and it it it, it starts from the base of it, that human beings are kind of, yeah. Um, just individuals but but co-ops kind of are the antidote to that and they start from the basis that human beings are kind of like we're inherently social and um we're, we're not self-reliant but we we flourish in a kind of community setting and so from taking a kind of communal approach to domestic tasks sharing and pooling resources and money um sharing the responsibility and care for one another i think housing co-ops kind of counter these kind of dominant neoliberal trends in society so I think a housing co-op can provide, you know, stability and a support network for young people, which are denied in the kind of rented and private sector. Um, and as young people, yeah, as, I, as I've just said, I guess, as young people are faced with increasingly precarious conditions, as well as a culture which kind of emphasizes social, like individual responsibility, co-ops kind of counter these trends by emphasizing community rather than individual responsibility. Um, yeah, I think the other thing is that, you know, co-ops are equitable so you know they, they kind of start from the basis that from each according to their ability to each according to their need that's the basis from which we start and it's opposed to the housing market which is quite inherently exclusionary and thrives on social inequality it's you know like owning a house is now the preserve of a few um and housing cooperatives on the other hand you know 
they're more accessible because rent is affordably priced, you know, council tax and bills are split, kind of labour is split as well. And because the rent is cheaper and labour is shared, people have, young people have the opportunity to not have to work you know, 37 hours a week, you know, because that rent is cheaper, you, that means you can spend time doing social activism or like, or with your other social commitments. Um, and I think there's also more security as well, because obviously in rented accommodation, you have to ensure that you pay the rent on time in full every month. And there's no safety net um, if something financially goes wrong. But in a co-op, because this is shared, then there is a safety net for, for young people who are, you know, who are struggling. Also, another thing is that obviously there's a lot more autonomy in, 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 in a cooperative as well, you know, you know, rented accommodation. I mean, the, the conditions of a lot of private rented accommodation at the moment is terrible. There's so much damp and, um, you know, it's just clinical white walls. You can't really own the space that you live in. You're just kind of existing in, in it. It's a very functional space. But, you know, I think there's so much to be said for a housing cooperative where you have control over your own space. Like even something like decorating your own room, like you can, you can actually make it a home. It's not just this functional space that you exist in. Um, it feels less transient. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's kind of linked to, you know, obviously young people are facing such a, a massive mental health crisis at the moment. And this can't be divorced from, you know, the kind of instability and precarity of, you know, the lives of young people at the moment. So I think, yeah, housing co-ops go some way towards, you know, re rectifying some of these, yeah, social issues. Um, yeah, sorry if that was a bit of a ramble, but yeah. <laughs> I really think that you covered quite a lot in that. Um, and you're right, you can look at it from so many different ways and like just purely the aesthetic value, like being able to, oh, I, I can't really show all my room, but like, but like, do anything that I want to in in my bedroom and that can just be for as long as I live here and you know being able to fix things or, or buy things immediately when they break um, rather than having to go to a landlord who says well you know maybe but then why hike your rent up um it will not give you deposit back it just feels like starting to even this power balance between like all of us need to live in houses but people who are able to own them and people who aren't um but yeah thank you for that i just um really quickly before we go on to the next um speaker i've just seen a question about like how how we like fell into fell into housing co-ops um and i mean i know for me i i joined like in 2019 and um it was at a time when I had only just graduate like finished university like I had just handed in my final dissertation and didn't know what I was doing but was super burnt out and just needed a break and for me coming at that point in my life like being able to just join a housing cart where it felt like there was some community around me there was some stability everything in my life was shifting but I could sort of just stay put for a while and think about what I wanted to do was so valuable and it continues to be um but yeah just really Connie I just wanted to ask like how did you find out about out of town were you out on a search looking for housing co-ops or or and um, yeah I, I didn't really know what a co-op was I mean before I moved in I was looking for a kind of community house but I didn't really understand exactly that a housing cooperative meant that you own the house and you collectively manage it um, but yeah, I was looking because I'd lived in HMOs, you know, um, before I joined and I found them very kind of isolating and alienating. You know, it's just strange to me that, you know, in a, in a HMO, like everyone will have their own cupboard with their own cutlery and their own plates and their own food when it just makes so much more sense to pool resources. And um, so, yeah, but when I moved in, yeah, I didn't really know exactly what a co-op was, but um, I've been here two and a half years now and I, I do know what they are now. <laughs> and I think they're just such a great way of, yeah, of, of yeah living um yeah yeah that's my experience yeah 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 absolutely thank you Connie um and yeah just feels like you're one of you're an example like me of like just sort of falling into it accidentally but I think a really useful thing about co-ops is that they they really like um they meet our everyday needs whether that is a house a bicycle some food like that's how we can you know talk to more people about co-ops and, and um understand that there is this alternative to this really like capitalist individualist like neoliberal system that we're 
sort of born into thinking is the only way. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, my next um, speaker is Tamsin. Do you want to say hi, Tamsin? Hello, how are we? Hello, very good, thank you. Bit cold. Um, sorry for leaving you to the end, but I'm, I'm, it's, it's so nice to have you here to be able to talk to you. Um, so where are you speaking to us from today? I'm currently speaking to you from Manchester and I must just do a little disclaimer that I'm sure in Soslaw, the plumber who I've been waiting for all day is going to arrive in the middle of this. So many apologies if that happens and I suddenly go blank or you just start hearing me talking about the burst pipe in the wall. But yeah, <laughs> speaking to you from Manchester at the moment. That's great. Hopefully that doesn't happen in the next 10 minutes. But if it happens, it happens. You might have um, really interesting things to say about co-ops. You never know. <laughs> yeah yeah quite possibly <laughs> so um so I just wanted to start off by asking you a bit about um your co-op so um do you would you rather talk about bread and roses or Bradford Cooperative Association um what and and, and just I'd like to hear a bit more about um your co-op and, and the aims of, of, of it so yes yeah, so my role um in the Bradford Cooperative Association is as the membership and communications officer so the membership side of that role sits mostly under the Bradford Cooperative Association and the communication side is more focused on bread and roses which is the cafe and co-working space that I mentioned earlier um I don't really have much input into Chapel Street Studio which is the other prong of the Bradford Cooperative Association so this will kind of I'll try and and um differentiate between the two which I'm talking about but it's muddled up in my own head to be honest um, but basically so Bradford Cooperative Association was set up to be like a community run business for the people of Bradford I think it began with um, people within Chapel Street Studio that wanted to provide a new more collaborative way of working creatively and, and digitally and, and providing a kind of ho a holistic way of, of all of that work um, to further organisations and pooling together these resources, which, you know, makes it a lot easier for people to access all of these um, different kind of creative and digital needs that, that organisations might have. And that kind of developed into the Bradford Cooperative Association, you know, if we can do this on a creative and digital basis, what more can we be providing to the community? So, um, but like, then I think, um, Bread and Roses kind of came out of that as a as a you know home for Travel Street Studio, but as well um, to provide like vegan and vegetarian food to the community in Bradford. Because I don't know how many of you have have kind of been um, to Bradford recently, but it's really been kind of almost forgotten about in lieu of with its location being so close to Manchester and Leeds. The high street is kind of dead. There's not a lot of options for people to do and people to get involved community wise and to be in a building that really does foster that community spirit. So I think that's really what Bread and Roses offers to the people of Bradford. And one of the main missions is to provide that, yeah, that community ownership and to give people in Bradford something back because for the founders of the co-op, I think being in Bradford has just cemented such a sense of, of that community drive and that collectivism and that kind of anti-capitalist nature that I think um, Connie was talking really eloquently about and so yeah all of those things together have kind of obviously over the last year with the challenges that Covid has provided as well have really cemented just how important it is to work on things together so I feel like I've touched on many different points there but I hope that gives some some kind of information around what these three different um, organisations are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you say, they work quite closely together, so it's really hard to untangle them. Detangle them? Distangle? Take them apart. Um, and you also talk really, really nicely about, like, how, you know, it, it came out of, of one project, but it, it is sort of a thing for, um, like, a home for the community. Like, lots of different um, projects can work out of it. And it is just a food space. And that that is lovely. Um, so so I, I, um, I know that you've been working in your role for a couple of, a couple of years. Um, can you talk a bit about um, the, the specific work that you get into and how, um, uh, I think you mentioned that you have... 12 to 15 members so how, how do you all work together? Yes yeah, so um, in a specific way that I do so is kind of figuring out the membership processes and kind of trying to make it more transparent to people that are involved because with being you know members co-op we don't really um, you, you can't really so I'm trying to figure out what I'm saying before I say it so I don't end up rambling again um, I'm 
we want to make sure that as many people have the opportunity to own the business as possible, but we also want to make sure that people are getting something out of it as well. So um, for me, it's been setting up the membership process from trial membership to um, full membership in which takes about nine months from start to end. And in that time, we require that people have an active interest in the cooperative, which um, is, is kind of really great because even though it comes out of giving that time, which is obviously what we, we want really engaged members, we want people who are going to have that community spirit and want to drive the cooperative forward but it's also making that active interest as kind of unique to everyone as possible so if someone wants to run a yoga class from the space that counts as an active interest if someone wants to you know go and um, spend money on our co-working space and get involved in that way that's an active interest it's really kind of tailoring it to the individual and making sure that that support is mutual and that benefits both parties equally and so we've recently had our away day, which was really nice and, and had quite a few members there who are involved in the organisation in other ways. And there really was just that emphasis on making sure that the vision that we've got is not only collective um, and, and kind of we're all driving that force together, but there's space for everyone's individual thoughts and opinions within that as well. And we can have those conversations around what does everyone want to get out of this and how can we make it uh, organisation that members really feel proud to own as well and, and proud to be part of so we've got um because we're a sociocratic model um we've got you know I'm an, I'm an officer and there's a few different officers within the organization who all lead circles um which then goes to um to the board who then can make decisions um and so yeah we've got a really like flat structure like the others have mentioned we've got a, a structure where people are able to um you know, raise any issues that they've got in that environment that makes it a lot easier, kind of like Connie was talking about with conflict resolution. It's not about one person saying no, and then it just doesn't happen. It's about having as many conversations as possible to hash out those issues before it ever becomes a problem down the line. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. that, that that's, that's really interesting. And I think that, like, it really, it really, helps that you can um like talk 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 to all of the members who are involved especially when when working can look a little bit different in each of those situations um and also talk about um as, as lucy pointed out in the chat like what what individual goals are versus what collective goals are um that yeah that um sounds really good i want to get to all the questions in the chat because they are popping um but I do just really quickly want to um, ask you one last question, Hamden, which was how how did you get into co-ops? Um, was it an accident? Was it sought out? So it's kind of the same as the others have said of kind of falling into it, because I think so I was at university at Leeds and I know there was a food co-op um, and it was kind of one of those things I always walked past and I always thought, you know, if I had more drive to be a better person, I would be buying all my fruits and veggies from there instead of going to Aldi. And then I thought, no, I shan't, not yet. Clearly it wasn't meant for me to do it at that point. Um, and so eventually, but I kind of kept seeing the word co-op around and I thought that's interesting. And then I worked at the Students' Union for a year, which kind of introduced me to the idea of a, um, a flat structure rather than a hierarchical structure, which was, you know, really interesting thinking, seeing, especially as a young person, seeing people kind of in their first step of their career, being at the top of an organisation and having that say over it was super interesting. And then I started working at the um, Bradford Cares, which was a project to kind of tackle homelessness within Bradford back in 2019, which was a Chapel Street studio project that was based out of Bread and Roses and kind of just as needs arose for you know someone to do social media I was able to do that for admin work I was able to do that and that's been able to like snowball into the role that I've got now which unfortunately I'm leaving next week but um so you've got me in just at the right time because I'm this is a really nice kind of summary um for me anyway to be able to think about what's happened over the last couple of years so um I was kind of able to be the you know just keep growing into the membership and communications officer and I think it being a cooperative at first didn't really seem like it seemed it was really interesting and it was you know a great thing to be involved in but I was doing a master's at the time as well it wasn't really the main like the main thing I was thinking about as a with work it was kind of just a part-time thing but especially through Covid we've got a lot of funding and a lot of grants from local um 
kind of local pots of money that we've been able to get and seeing that community support and that community spirit has really solidified the importance of corps for me because I think I saw so many people you know one of my best friends works at Morrison's through the pandemic and worked in the Amazon department within Morrison's and she was being treated terribly you know there's so many people that weren't wearing masks in the, in the height of it and you know having to work these long hours and I thought I'm so lucky to not be doing any of that because it's, it is so community run, it is for the benefit of everyone that's involved, as opposed to the benefit of someone that's going to get the profits at the end of the day, and you're not going to see any of that. So I think, yeah, that's that's what's been the best thing about getting involved in the co-op, even though I kind of fell into it. Um, I'm, I'm so happy that it was because it really, yeah, especially through through the pandemic. I think it's when when everything becomes so individual because you just sat at home in a room not seeing anyone in my case it's like you've got all these people out there that you know are walk, working towards a shared goal and being able to come back into an environment where that is what's happening as opposed to having to go to work and feel like you're working for someone else working for the community is just yeah such an invaluable experience and it's been yeah co-ops are just bloody fantastic aren't they Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the co-ops are bloody fantastic. The new title of this webinar. No, um, don't want to romanticise it. Like there, there are definitely inherent issues in it, and and um, that's that's part of anyone working or living together, right? Like they're not a magical silver bullet. Um, there, there, there are difficult problems, but I think the real emphasis here on like communication, respect, and like consensus and, and and trying to to work together to make decisions that's that's what really makes the difference to me at least um okay well well thank you so much for Tamsin so great to hear about your whole journey um and really best of luck with the next chapter of your journey um I I I don't really know how to do this next section because I haven't really probably been looking at the Q&A but I know that lots of things have come off um Petra, Leila, do you have any ideas about how we should take these questions in order or? Um... Um, I could just spotlight all of the speakers now and, and highlight a couple of questions that have come through, if, if that's the best thing to do. Yes, please. Yeah, that'd be great. OK, I mean, just sorry, while I spotlight people, I could just ask my question because then it's easy to find. But just from uh, we work at Cooperatives UK who are running these webinars as part of the Hive. Um, and obviously, we want to make sure that young people are the future of co-ops and co-ops are the future for young people. But apart from you've all sort of um, highlighted that you have found out about co-ops through higher education and, and going to university. Um, but how do we reach more young people and how do we get co-ops in front of young people that maybe perhaps aren't able to access university or high, higher education? And, you know, have you got any ideas about doing this within in the community or? Yeah. Mm. Uh, That's such an important question, really, because, um, yeah, I hadn't noticed this until you said it. But, yeah, all of us have talked about sort of coming across co-ops at some point during um Junior University. I think personally for me, um, I would hope that um, work that we're doing is not um, closed off in university um, silos. Um, I, I did start off in, in student co-ops. Um, that's, that's how I found them, learned more about them, got exposed to this. Um, and then, and then, but being able to join this cop, which like not for students, not for any specific demographic, it's kind of open. Um, I, I kind of found out about it because it was being advertised on my local Facebook pages. Um, and so, from a housing co-op perspective, um, like really making sure that when you're looking for new members and doing recruitment, that you're reaching outside of your bubbles and. Um, we helped run a recruitment process earlier this year. I don't know if we were successful, but that was definitely like something that we were actively trying to do, try and reach outside of um, just our networks, friends of friends. Um, but I don't know, do, do any of the other speakers have um, ideas for that? I guess one of the things is not just um, how to access people, 
but also how to make co-ops more part of a mainstream um, piece of knowledge so that so that when you're contacted about do you want to be a member of a housing co-op your response isn't either like what's a housing co-op or like oh no that's for hippies um so it you know it's not just getting those people at the point where there's an opportunity for them to be a member of a co-op it's kind of getting them much before that and i think it would be really great if the opportunities that we all had at university to become members of co-ops were were part of that because again it's not even even if you like you said Tamsin you weren't you were like nah I don't want to do that right now but it made meant that you started becoming aware of co-ops um and what they were and and realizing that it's not just for weirdos um or only for lovely weirdos uh so I don't know I've thought lots of times about if there is scope for kind of going to schools or like um, extracurricular activities or clubs or camps or colleges or whatever and facilitating people setting up cooperatively run structures there. Um, that's something I'd be interested in exploring. I don't know if that's something that's happening already or not, but I think that would be cool. I think we're really lucky and uh, as kind of a generation of young people that we're uh, in, in my experience anyway, and again, this is an experience of having gone to university and done a master's and been around young people that are also at university and, you know, in those things, but people are so open-minded and people like young people see the world in a very fluid way that I think is a really exciting, it's a really exciting time to be like in, in, in these projects and in these cooperatives and think about things in a different way. And like young people are a lot more aware that the world is changing and want to be that change as well. Like I know that I went back to my high school and there was like a gender neutral toilet when, you know, when I was at the high school, there would never have even been, there was never talk of, you know, gay was still used as an insult. So it's kind of like the world is changing so quickly and that change is being led by young people. So I think, it's it's not so this isn't you know it's not an answer of how we can get people involved but it's more just st stressing that I think young people are receptive to hearing these alternative ways of living and, and of working and an alternative future and it's yeah it's kind of like it's a it's the best time to be in a co-op really because you've got an audience an audience of people that are willing to hear it so <laughs> fingers crossed anyway yeah I think that sounds great um yeah uh, are there any other questions um jen had asked if there were any this was specifically about housing co-ops but i suppose we could broaden it to all co-ops are, are there any difficulties of living or working in a in a co-op absolutely <laughs> yeah don't so get me there. started <laughs> <laughs> no 100% there are like like ongoing in my life at the moment like community lovely word when you think about it abstract it, in the real it means dealing with people on a one-to-one -one basis um trying to like organize towards a shared goal whatever that looks like um, and and people get on each other's nerves. Um, we say the wrong things. We 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 hurt each other inevitably. Um, I know that I've done that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's hard because you're sort of coming from the perspective of I'm going to accept you as my equal, and we're going to try and do something together. And you know, it, it's it's not a um, I'm your boss, and I'm going to tell you what to do. I don't really care about your feelings. It's not that. And with that comes so much. I, I could really talk about this for a while. Um, but I guess I, something I said earlier, just like trying to acknowledge that, that we are inevitably going to cause each other harm just by existing in this world, but especially by trying to organize together and, and trying to acknowledge and work within that. Yeah, talk, talk to each other a bit better. I don't know does anyone else have anything to say about this I think particularly like in a housing cooperative because obviously we all have kind of the relationships you have in a house um but then also we also have like 
we're also in a working relationship as well because we have to manage everything within that house um and there's kind of I guess like, like individual dynamics and then you're also kind of like managing the group dynamic as well so there's a lot of dynamics going on there um and obviously yeah yeah so I guess that's like yeah what I would yeah would say is a difficulty um but it's also great as well because you learn lots of skills like active communication and um, because there is you are you know you're yeah yeah I guess like in a HMO in the private rented sector I mean like yeah you don't have to act you, you're not kind of you don't have to actively foster kind of like those kinds of relationships with your housemates because you're not working with them as well um but I think yeah I've learned a lot in terms of kind of conflict resolution and active communication and co-op you wouldn't necessarily learn in kind of other settings um which is yeah really good skills to have yeah I think that that it's obviously there's loads of difficulties there's difficulty in every every kind of setup but I suppose the specific difficulties are that you end up with conflicts and there is not a simple predefined hierarchy to, to to like fall back on so in a traditional working like top-down structure it might be that you have a disagreement with somebody and then it's like well whoever's more senior gets the last say uh, and we don't have that and so that means that we have to talk about it and and like understand each other and all of those other terrible things. Um, and I don't know, I think that it's, I think those are easier though, because you have that preconceived, uh, you kind of, you already know that you're going to have to have those conversations, I think. And anyway, when it all gets like quite hard, I remind myself that uh, easier is not always better. <laughs> um, and I don't think it's necessarily more difficult or, or less difficult, really. But, um, but it's also true that sometimes things are like I wouldn't. It would. I think I would be very unlikely to go back to working in a traditional way because I don't think I could give up the, um, the like amount of autonomy and freedom and um, I don't know, whatever decision making power that I have at the moment uh, in return for maybe sometimes like simple ways of making decisions because I get to say or somebody else gets to say. And that was a bit of a ramble as well. Yeah, definitely echoing that. Sorry, Tamsin. Sorry, yeah, um, I thought, shall I get started on the problems in co-ops? And I thought, no, I shan't. And then I thought, yes, I shall. Um, but <laughs> I think one of the points that's also really important to raise is that the same structures that exist outside of co-ops still exist within co-ops. Like, there's no separating kind of the patriarchy or racial inequalities or like gender inequalities and um, class inequalities from co-ops. And I think that we like want to exist like we think that they're like these like little like utopias where like none of those things exist but they do and I think that's something that we need to be aware of even you know that those things can still crop up and part of those problems is the fact that they're internalized so people aren't necessarily thinking of it as oh this is a co-op led by a man or whatever you know but it's it, it can still be the case just by how we're raised and how and how people communicate with each other on those levels so I think Co-ops are a good place to be in that they act in microaggressions. That's the word, Jen. Thank you. Um, like, we, like we, you co-ops seem to be full of people that are more aware of those issues and more aware of addressing them within themselves than, in my experience, working in other in other kinds of organisations. But they do still exist. So I think, um, yeah, I guess that's not a problem specific to co-ops. But I think sometimes when you are in an organisation where it's like, oh, this is great, it's a lot harder to address those issues as well when. Everyone, like no one wants to hurt each other's feelings so it can be like harder to say actually you are hurting my feelings and and address it in those aspects so yeah I think that's still being aware of the wider world that we inhabit within a cooperative is an issue um so much so all, all of you yeah absolutely spot on saying things that I couldn't I couldn't articulate thank you so much um yeah um I I can see that we've only got like a handful of minutes left have I made that phrase up I'm going with it um Leila are there any other questions um that oh yeah of course okay um so so maybe we should um 
maybe we should wrap up there um, because I know that um, Petra wants to say a couple of words about um, the Hive who have very kindly helped us um, put on this webinar today. Um, and just want to say a really quick thank you, massive thank you to all of the speakers, Lucy, Tamsin, Connie, thank you so much for joining us and all of the audience people, audience people, members that, um, you know who you are, thank you for coming today. Um, and we hope you've, we've made you think a little bit, inspired you a little bit. Um, but Petra, over to you. Um, I'm, I'm not a young person, <laughs> so um, thanks very much, um, Sim, and for all our speakers today. It's it's been a joy listening. Um, and the passion and, and the enthusiasm there has been been marvelous, and wonderful, um, and just hearing all those dis different perspectives of different cooperatives. Um, I hope that everyone on on the call today has found that really useful and, and interesting. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we um, delighted that through the Hive Business Support Programme and our partnership with the Cooperative Bank that we've been able to bring this webinar to you today. And, and, and we have supported um, cooperatives over the last six years through the Hive Business Support Programme and also through Cooperatives UK, our resources on our website um, and, and other advice that we, we can give. Um, and I know, um, I remember Lucy coming to one of my Is a Co-op Right For You sessions um, back when, I can't remember how long ago it was now. So it's great that through the Hive, we followed your journey and we were able to support you in those early days um, and, and lots of other cooperatives. Um, so uh, there are other Hive webinars um, coming up in the series. I think um, my colleague Leila put the link in, in the chat. Um, and so if you want to join others, you, you're very welcome to. Um, the Hive Business Support Programme, the link, um, we'll share that as well after the event or through the chat. Um, there is support available to anyone setting up a cooperative um, and people can apply for that support. And we also have what we call our online step-by-step um, -step tool. So anyone that kind of wants to work through their business idea and wants to think about what they need to think about before they apply, that's a really useful step-by-step -step tool. And, and there are lots of resources on, on that website. Um, so I'd really point people to that. Um, and, you know, we even have an online registration tool and, and, and lots of different ways to, to help you. Um, and of course, once you get support through the Hive, you can then become members of Cooperatives UK. And then we have lots of advice and services that we can offer um, our, our cooperatives and our members. So I, th I think that's all I want to say. And just, you know, a big thank you again to everyone. It's been lovely listening to everyone and hearing those stories and um, I hope that participants on the call today have been able to kind of be be um, inspired by that to think about you know their new cooperative or their existing cooperative and getting new members etc. Um, is there anything I've missed Leila should I've mentioned anything else or is that and I think we'll this record this is being recorded so we'll share that as well afterwards um, so that's available to everyone. So that's enough from me I think and we're just just a minute over so um but if anyone does want to have any specific questions after this um we you can post it to our email um which ladies just posted in the chat um and we can pick those up as well um and respond to those so thanks very much again thanks sim for um hosting today and thanks again to our speakers <laughs>